Hello, I'm Anne. And this is Imelda. And the Society News for Friday the 23rd of June is... As some of you are aware, the Society is conducting a client consultation survey. To give you an advanced warning of the questions, including in the survey, it follows the county press. But before the recording of In Touch, in future weeks it will follow the recording of In Touch for as long as the survey continues. If you would like to complete a survey independently, please contact the Society on 522205 and ask for a copy. Alternatively, you can find the survey on our website at www.iwsb.org.uk. Now, on Tuesday, there will be two coffee mornings held in aid of the Society on Tuesday the 27th of June. The first at West White, End of the Line Cafe, from 10.30am to 12pm and Bembridge, the Cloisters, 10.15 to 12pm. Please go along and support these if you are able. The Dolphins will be swimming this coming Tuesday evening, Tuesday the 27th of June, at the Waterside Pool in Ryde. The swimming group has sole use of the pool during the session and there are lifeguards in attendance. If you are interested in joining the group, please contact the Society to advise us of your swimming ability and for us to advise the Waterside Pool. Wednesday, the weekly coffee morning will be held as usual to support the Society this Wednesday the 28th of June. The coffee mornings are not just for blind and partially sighted people. Anyone can come along and have a cup of coffee or tea as well as a piece of cake. Thursday, on Thursday the 29th of June, the Knitters and Natterers will be meeting at Millbrook House. The group meets at 10.30am until 2pm. As well as the knitting, there's plenty of nattering, as well as volunteers that come in and read to the group during the afternoon. Friday, the Striders will be going out for their monthly stride on Friday, June the 30th. The stride will be going in the New Forest. The stride will start at Brockenhurst Railway Station. The number 7 bus leaves Newport Bus Station at 9.20. Please note, bus concessions for seniors will not apply. Arrives Yarmouth at 9.50. Ferry departs 10.05 and the train departs at 10.57 and arrives at Brockenhurst at 11.08. Combined ferry and train ticket per person to Brockenhurst costs £18.50 return or £12.35 with a rail card. Please note, we may all get the lower rate with a group ticket, but we must all travel back at the same time. It is anticipated that the group will catch the 1542 train back for the 1600 hours ferry crossing and the 1655 bus which arrives Newport at 1735. Lunch will be either the snake catcher, food uh, noon to 9pm, or Forester's Arms, food only noon to 3pm, both near Brockenhurst Station. Any other news? The Society has received some new padded wallets which will be trialled on both the Talking News and Library Service. If you receive one of these wallets, you will notice instead of a Velcro tap, they have, sorry, you will notice that instead of a Velcro top, they have a zip. However, you will still need to turn the address card round on the front as normal. And then general knowledge, there's a fun quiz night on Friday the 30th of June at Millbrook House, 137 Carisbrook Road, Newport, vehicle access for parking via Castle Road. 6.30pm for 7pm start, cost is £3 per person, teams of four. Ticket price includes nibbles, coffee and tea. Pay bar available for wine and beer. All welcome. If you don't have a team, make one with others. And again, you call 522205 
or you can pay at the door. Now there's some more society news. The next OWL session will be meeting on Wednesday the 5th of July at 2 p.m. in Melbrook House. The entertainment for the meeting will be a film and music quiz. The quiz master will be our very own Chris Kane. The group lasts approximately 45 minutes, which is then followed by tea or coffee and cake. Sourcing accessible TV guides and especially those highlighting audio described TV programmes can be difficult. There are web-based large print audio and braille TV guides available. RNIB's Big Print Preview Guide has the full listing of the top 10 preview channels. The Big Print Weekly Newspaper contains a TV supplement listing programmes on BBC One, Two, ITV One, Channel Four and Channel Five. And for more information, please visit the RNIB website www rnib.org.uk or call them on 03031 The Users Forum will meet for the first time this coming Wednesday 28th of June at 12pm until 1. If you are interested in joining the Users Forum please contact the Society again on 522205. Dolphin Technology Information Day, Monday the 3rd of July. Dolphin will be coming to Millbrook House along with Calibre, Enhanced Vision, Orcam, Wireless for the Blind, Blind Veterans and the Macula Society. They will be bringing information and some equipment with them for demonstration. The event will be a drop-in from 10am until 2.30pm, so no appointments necessary. And now we go on to the scaffolding news. Please find below a list of known footway obstructions for works including scaffolding or hoarding. We are unable to include end dates as many are extended on a week-by-week -week basis. Also included are tables and chairs permits that have been issued in the past week. So first the Bay Area, Lloyds Bank, Regent Street, Shanklin, 11 High Street, Braiding and 8 New Road, Braiding. The Cows Area, the development site in Castle Street, East Cows, 2 Sun Hill Cows, 10 Bath Road Cows, Carvel Court Terminus Road cows due up on the 26th of June. Waitrose Well Street East cows due up on the 14th of August. Newport area. Nippert Court West Street Newport. Red Squirrel Property Shop 11 St Thomas's Square Newport. The Guild Hall High Street Newport. The Spectacle Maker, 81A, a High Street, Newport. Penny Lane, Green Party Shop, 114 St James Street, Newport. Bernard Shoe Shop, 86A, St James's Street, Newport. 272 to 283 Arctic Road, Cows. 93 High Street, Cows. Home Bargains, Taylor Road, Gunville Road, Carisbrook, Stead and Simpsons, 121 High Street, Newport, due on the 3rd of July, 127 Honey Hill, Newport, due on the 3rd of July. And then in the Ride area, the Solent Court, Castle, Castle Street Ride, 25 George, sorry, 25 George Street Ride, Ride Street Gallery, 129A High Street Ride. The Italian Touch, 52 Union Street Ride. St Mary's Church, along St Mary's Passage Ride. Land of Roses, 2 Union Street. Oasis Dental Care, 9 Melville Street. Royal British Legion Club, 1 St James's Street. 
Robert Lee's Hairdressers, 62 Union Street, Ride Town Club, Star Street, The Star, High Street Ride, due up on the 26th of June, The Cabin, Nelson Place Ride, due up on the 3rd of July. All that is ride. West White Area, The King's Head, Key Street, Yarmouth, Fry's Jewellers, Kimberley House, High Street, Freshwater, due up on the 28th of June. And South White, 20 High Street, Ventnor, 47 Moor View, God's Hill, 5 Spring Hill, Ventnor. And finally, this week's In Touch. In Touch, in this week's episode, listener Mike Kelly lost his sight in his 30s, shortly after he'd finished his training as an architect. He underwent intensive rehabilitation and has had a successful full-time career in the civil, cur- thir- in the civil service. Now aged 65, Mike has chosen to retire. Mixed in with the excitement of starting a new chapter in his life, He has some fears and concerns as well. David Black, who has retinitis pigmentosa, was attacked three times. Despite having studied martial arts, he felt unable to defend himself as a blind person. He sought help from a charity in Scotland, which runs self-defence courses for disabled people. David's confidence has skyrocketed since, and he now teaches the same course, which helped to boost his confidence to other blind people. And now we'll be reading articles from the Isle of Wight County Press for Friday, the 23rd of June, 2017. The headlines this week are Mast Cast Shadow Over Sunshine Title and motorbike rider dies on country road. So beginning with that story about the mast. Shanklin's title as one of the sunniest places in Britain could be put in the shade thanks to a recently installed phone mast. A sunshine sunshine recorder was set up on the roof of Shanklin Theatre in 1947, then the town hall and has been proving the town's sunshine credential ever since. However, since the mast was set up by Milestone Communications on March the 14th, Shanklin is losing one and a half hours of sunshine each day in the eyes of the Met Office. Meteorological, meteorologist Clive Cooper, who has been recording sunshine levels since 1990, said it's about three feet away and casts a shadow. I have to walk round the legs of the antenna to get to the sunshine recorder. It's right next to it. A milestone spokesman said they were unable to comment on the position of the mask. This is not the first time Shanklin's sunshine has been put in peril. In 2012, the award for sunniest place in the UK was mistakenly given to Eastbourne, despite Shanklin enjoying a solid 66 hours more sunshine. The revelation sparked concerns that the island would be missing out on millions of pounds in tourism publicity. Things are set to get even worse for Shanklin due to the new Met Office health and safety guidelines. According to Clive, the hooped ladder which leads up to the recorder does not meet regulations. He said other stations with similar ladders had been closed down but Shanklin was overlooked. The aerial has precipitated all this because I was going along completely oblivious that there was a change in regulations about the hoop ladders, said Clive. If the issue with the ladder cannot be resolved, then the site will be closed, making the position of aerials irrelevant. With the recorder gone, Shanklin's sunshine will be calculated using averages. Councillor Chris Quirk, Isle of Wight Council member for Shanklin, said since the end of the Second World War, the roof of Shanklin Theatre has historically been the sunniest place in the UK. We need to record the data to keep us in the limelight. Motorbike rider dies on country road. A motorcyclist involved in a collision near Newtown on Wednesday 
died from his injuries at the scene, police have confirmed. In a statement issued yesterday, Thursday, a police spokeswoman said, We are appealing for witnesses following a fatal collision on the Isle of Wight yesterday evening. Officers were called just before 5.50pm to reports of a collision involving a Volkswagen Beetle and a motorcycle on Corfe Road, Shalfleet. Despite the efforts of paramedics, the motorcyclist, a 30-year-old man from Cowes, was pronounced dead at the scene. His next of kin have been informed and are being supported by specialist officers. The driver of the car, a 62-year-old man, was uninjured. Our roads policing officers are investigating the exact circumstances of the collision. Sir Mark Thornley said, We're keen to speak to anyone who may have witnessed this collision or who saw either the motorbike or dark blue beetle in the area prior to what happened. Any information you have could assist our investigation, so please get in touch. Anyone with information can contact us on 101 quoting 441 Seven zero two three seven zero four six, or Crime Stoppers anonymously on zero eight zero zero five 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 one one one. Sponsor saves cows fireworks. Cows Week will go with a bang this year. The famous firework display has been rescued by the event's recently announced title sponsor, Lendy, the Property Forum. The finale, to be named Lendy Cows Week Fireworks, will go ahead after months of speculation about its future. Cows Fireworks Committee, formed of regatta organisers Cows Week Limited, Cows Town Waterfront Trust, the Isle of Wight Council, Cows Town Council and Cows Business Association thanked Lendy and all those who supported the fundraising effort. In addition to Lundy, key supporters of the week are Red Funnel, Cows Week Limited, Cows Town Council, Local Yacht Cubs and Cows Town Water Trust, Waterfront Trust. The display has taken place on the, Friday, la, the final Friday of Cow's Week since the very earliest days of the regatta and is viewed by many as a crucial part of the onshore festivities. This week's display, this year's display, will take place on Friday, August the 4th at 9.30pm. Cow's Week Limited Commercial and Marketing Director Kate Johnson said, We're thrilled Lindy, ha Lindy has not only committed to an initial three-year title sponsorship of Cow's Week, but also that the peer-to-peer -peer investment company has agreed to be the primary supporter of this year's display. Those watching the firework display this year may notice a predominant blue theme as a thank you to Lindy, who used blue as their prime brand colour. Lendy co-founder and director Liam Brook said, We're very pleased to be able to provide funding to enable the traditional firework display to go ahead. The fireworks are synonymous with Cow's Week. We wouldn't have wanted them to have not gone ahead the first year of our title sponsorship. Visitors to Lendy Cow's Week on Friday, August the 4th will also enjoy the additional entertainment provided by the, a display from the iconic Red Arrows at 7.30pm, supported by Artemis Investment Management. They knew the risks, but carried on regardless. Heroic. That's the only word I can use to describe their actions. Islander Steve Apter, Deputy Commissioner of London Fire Brigade, has paid tribute to the incredible efforts of firefighters who risked their lives to tackle the Grenfell Tower blaze and rescue those trapped inside. Mr Apter, the island's former Chief Fire Officer, told the county press how he had hugged fellow island firefighter Stuart MacDonald 
as he donned breathing apparatus and prepared to enter the burning building. Many of the firefighters were marking their names on their helmets before they went in. They knew that building could collapse. At one point, we had 104 firefighters in there, or just outside. They all knew what they were walking into, and not one of them questioned it, said Mr Apter. His involvement started with a call at 1.15am when he was told they were dealing with a fire of unprecedented scale. I spoke to firefighters who've been with the brigade for 40 years and even they had seen nothing like this, he said. Watching foot footage as he worked to coordinate resources from the fire services headquarters, Mr Apter said he couldn't believe what he was seeing. I thought that can't be the incident we're dealing with. That looks like it'd been burning for days, he said. After ensuring resources were in place to keep the rest of London safe, while huge numbers of firefighters were diverted to North Kensington, Mr Apter headed to the scene himself. When I drove around the corner and saw it with my own eyes for the first time, my thought, first thought was of 9-11. Firefighters worked tirelessly throughout the day to reach those trapped inside. But by 7.30pm, and with mounting concerns about the building's stability, Mr Apter was involved in making the difficult decision to order a te tactical withdrawal. The incident commander made the decision with my full support. At that point, it was really difficult decision. We knew there were still people in there. The operation then switched from rescue to recovery, with specialist emergency services working through the building, trying to identify all those affected. Mr Apter, who met with Prime Minister Theresa May and leader of the opposition Jeremy Corbyn at the scene, said he was extremely proud of the efforts of his colleagues. And a team's tribute after the tragedy. Firefighters from Freshwater and Yarmouth came together for a minute's silence to pay tribute to the Grenfell Tower fire victims and to support their emergency service colleagues. They met for drill outside Freshwater Fire Station on Tuesday and were supported by Freshwater Parish Council and a large number of residents. Freshwater Fire Station watch manager Steve Moran said the minute silence was not about us. It was about the victims of the tragedy and us paying respect to all members of the emergency service, firefighters, ambulance and the police. We had colleagues from Hampshire there who were involved, so it was us saying thank you. We put the minute silence up on our Facebook page it was not about publicity for us, and we were taken aback by how many people turned up. After the silence, we went to visit a home in Kendall Road, which suffered a kitchen fire over the weekend. This is something we do all the time to help our community. If there's a fire in a home, we return and speak to the occupants and offer them advice on how to prevent it again. We all live here, and we want the public to come to us for advice. We're very approachable and would prefer to prevent rather than put out a fire. And also, there was a minute silence observed in respect of the victims of Grenfell Tower, the fire in London, at the Ireland's Law Courts at 11am on Monday. And on the same theme, we're all still struggling to compute it all. The family of a London firefighter who helped rescue trapped residents from Green Grenfell Tower, are raising money to help those affected by the tragedy. The Watts family of Vinings Garden Sandown hoped to raise £10,000 for the firefighters charity after husband and father Dave Watts was called to the scene last week. He spent seven hours inside the building helping people escape at temperatures rising up to 1,000 cc centigrade. Although the death toll is still expected to rise, 79 people 
are thought to have died in the blaze. Dave said, We're all still trying to compute the what's, ifs and whys. It was just shocking and everyone is still trying to get their heads around it. We left the fire station about 2.30am and didn't return until 7pm. You go in and you do it. You don't really think about it until afterwards, he said. Dave Watts became a firefighter in the year 2000 and was originally retained at Sandown before transferring to London. Although he is now part of a small team specialising in dealing with terrorism, all London firefighters were called to the scene. Dave was unable to speak about the inside of the building as an investigation is ongoing, but said the hardest part, recovering bodies from upper floors, was yet to come. He said, I'd rather go in when the building was alight. It's worse now than going in when the adrenaline is rushing. Dave's wife, Debbie, has set up a Just Giving page to raise money for the charity, which offers rehabilitation and rescue and res and um, recuperation, sorry to hyphen, for firefighters and their friends in three centres across the UK. The charity has no regular government funding and relies on donation and fundraising. Dave said, The London Fire Brigade have been fantastic, but what we went to last week really was unprecedented and will infect people further down the line. It was horrific and everyone who has been there will have a wobble at some stage. And you can deny, donate at t-i-n-y-u-r-l dot com forward stroke y-a-c-l-a-a-z-e And on the same subject, the brother of a man who died in London's Grenfell Tower Fire has thanked his friends and neighbours for their kindness. Kenneth Disson age 71, of John Nash Avenue in East Cowes, said, I just want to say thank you. The people in East Cowes have been brilliant. I went down there this morning and someone I don't even know gave me a card. The body of Kenneth's brother, Tony, was found in the tower block on Saturday. Kenneth said, My brother lived on the 22nd floor and was found on Saturday in the stairwell. He never made it down. Tony was 65 and he leaves behind four siblings as well as a wife, four sons and a grandchild. Kenneth said one of his boys was just sitting there outside the tower all night hoping he would come out. I feel better now I know he has been recovered because we all thought he was still in the flat. We would have been devastated because there would have been nothing left. But my family got a phone call from the police to say they'd found him. He was on the stairwell, obviously trying to get out, and he was overcome by smoke. I suppose we're luckier than other families. At least we can bury him. Kenneth said he was hoping to go to London on Friday when the body of his brother is released. Kenneth added, I just want to see the block as well. I don't know if it's going to help me, but I just feel I need to do that. It's all spinning round in my head. I just want to thank people for their kindness and kind words. An afternoon tea fundraising event will be held at Ride Fire Station for the victims of Grenfell Tower. The event will be held on Saturday between 2 and 4 p.m. with tea, coffee and cakes. And there will be a raffle with prizes including tickets to the V-Dub Festival. And also, Key Arts in Newport is holding a benefit gig for those affected by the fire in London, featuring performances by Ohms, Dynamix and DJ Slow. The event will take place <clears throat> on Sunday from 7 till, till 11pm. Guests are asked to make a minimum entry donation of £5 and the money raised will go to the Red Cross Grenfell Fund. Delight as dolphin swims into play. A playful dolphin has been causing a splash in cows. 
Friends on board a cow suitability boat were lucky enough to spot the dolphin while cruising on Tuesday. The group were enjoying a leisurely trip around cows when Mia Jessamy Hillier captured footage of the dolphin. Emily Thompson, who volunteers for Cows Sailability, a group that provides boat trips for people with disabilities, said, We had a lovely time out on the water. It was topped off by seeing a dolphin and a lovely jellyfish. It was an amazing sight. Dolphins have been spotted around cows several times this week. The friendly creature swam in front of the floating bridge on the East Cow's side of the river, forcing the floating bridge staff to delay the crossing on a sweltering Monday afternoon. Meanwhile, David Mikolovic and Rust Jolliffe were riding jet skis near cows when the dolphin popped up alongside them. David said, It stayed with us for around two hours, following us and playing with the jet ski. It was really friendly and playful. I'm still buzzing. Youngsters out on the water kayaking and kayaking and paddle boarding with UKSA were thrilled when the dolphin started swimming around them. As beach weddings go, the Solent shore was more than a match for the Indian Ocean. Queen Victoria would most certainly have been amused by the first wedding to take place on what was her private beach at Osborne House as the heat wave started. Jonathan Henney and teacher J. Anne Tisdale from the Chandler's Cows tied the knot on Saturday before jetting off on honeymoon to California, where, ironically, the temperature in the Sunshine State was not a patch on the Sunshine Isle. J. Anne's mother, Joan, from the Avenue, Topland Bay, said the wedding was absolutely perfect and the weather beautiful. Our daughter wanted a dream wedding on a beach in Mauritius, but we had to cancel that because I was unwell. But she got her dream wedding after all. Robber foiled by Have A Go Hero. Drug user Adam Garley threatened to slash a teenage shop assistant across the face and stab her before he robbed the store of nearly £400. However, a bystander stepped in and hit Garley over the head with a frying pan before he fled with the cash, the Isle of Wight Crown Court heard on Tuesday. Garley, 32, of Upper Green Road, St Helens, admitted one charge of robbery when he appeared before the court for sentence. The court was to- told Garley robbed the co-op in Ride on April the 15th this year, with a hood pulled over his face to conceal his identity. He went up to a till and demanded the assistant give him all the money. The assistant replied she was not able to. Garley said, give me all your money, I will stab you and slash your face, according to Jeremy Wright's prosecuting. Garley tried to force the till open and began hitting the screen. Eventually, the store's deputy manager went to another till and opened it, giving Carly £393 in notes. However, a member of the public stepped in, hit Garley over the head with a frying pan and pulled his hoodie off before Garley managed to free. He was later arrested by police. The court was told Garley had 29 convictions for 53 offences, including possession of heroin and robbery. Representing Garley, Elizabeth Bussey Jones said her client was not in possession of a knife, but accepted staff would not have known that. She added Garley had a long-standing addiction to Class A drugs. He has been the victim of a serious attack when he was 15, resulting in his suffering from post-traumatic stress order leading to drug abuse. She said, he knows if he does not resolve this, he will become a statistic who dies through the use of drugs. Gali was jailed for two years and told to pay a victim surcharge. Media companies bid to buy County Press Group. County Press shareholders are being recommended to accept a takeover by NewsQuest Media Group, 
publishers of many regional papers, including the Southern Daily Echo in Southampton. The Isle of Wight County Press Group Board is urging shareholders to accept the offer, which they have been advised is a fair one and one that properly reflects the value of the group. NewsQuest Media Group is one of the largest publishers of local newspapers in the UK. It publishes a range of newspapers and websites and has extensive digital publishing experience as well as well-equipped newspaper printing facilities. On behalf of the board, Robin Freeman, County Press Group Chief Executive, said, The board strongly believes this is the best way forward for our group of companies. It provides access to the skills, knowledge and expertise we need in order for us to be able to adapt and change the existing business to meet the opportunities and challenge of the new media landscape. Henry Foray Walker, NewsQuest's Chief Executive, said, We look forward to the opportunity of working with the Isle of Wight County Press, its staff and the community it represents, in building on their success as one of the county's strongest local news brands and helping them forge a strong and sustainable future. The shareholders' decision is expected in approximately four weeks. Risk of losing money on energy plan reduced. The risk of the Isle of Wight Council losing money if a tidal energy project fails has been reduced, a meeting was told. Authority Chief Executive John Metcalf said five years ago when the Isle of Wight Council decided to invest a million pounds, a sum matched by private enterprise, the risk money might be lost, was recognised. But now, after necessary consents have been granted, the project has a value and could be sold on to a third party, he said. Concerns about project delays were raised at a meeting of the Isle of Wight Council's Scrutiny Committee by Green Councillor Michael Lilly. Tory leader Councillor Dave Stewart said, Just because this project has not yet come to fruition doesn't mean it isn't going to happen. A spokesman for the Perpetuous Tidal Energy Centre, PTEC, Tidal Energy Generation Project, denied it had been delayed. We're still working to the target of generating power during 2020, he said. The tidal turbine array is planned to use world-leading turbine technologies to produce a 30 megawatt of renewable energy. PTEC's offshore site lies 1.3 nautical miles south of St Catherine's Point and could generate electricity to power more than 15,000 homes. Councillor Chris Whitehouse has stepped down as the Isle of Wight Council Cabinet Member for Education and Children's Services. He made the announcement at last Thursday's Cabinet meeting, where he said he would continue to work with the Tory leadership on a number of special projects. He will keep his role as a local ward councillor. Councillor Whitehouse said he was studying for a Master of Arts in Contemporary Ethics and needed to focus on his 15,000-word dissertation. Councillor Paul Brading, who represents Lake South, will take on his Cabinet role. Councillor Whitehouse said, It's been a pleasure and a privilege to lead on education for the Conservatives for four years now, but I have to admit that finalising four 4,000 word essays while going through the local and general elections was a bigger challenge than I ever anticipated. Councillor Brading said, Chris leaves a big pair of brutes to step into, but I'm determined to give this vital role my very best effort. Our children deserve no less. Sharks washed up on a beach. Sharks have been spotted on the beach at Chilton Chine. Photos sent to the county press show a number of smooth hound sharks washed up on the beach. Hannah Butt from the Blue Reef Aquarium, South Sea, said a number of factors may have caused this. Normally, this happens because of rough seas. However, we've had a lot of nice weather at the moment, so this may not necessarily be the case here. 
or, she said, they could have been trapped by commercial fishing nets during fishing, fishing for a different species. Hannah says, when they get caught up in the nets, fishermen tend to put them back in the sea and they may not be in the best of health. Nets and trawlers catch them and there is no way of stopping them from getting caught. Everest is at the top of Ventnor's Hill. Ireland cyclist Tim Wiggins is planning to cycle to the top of Everest without ever leaving the island. The Everesting Challenge will see the 26-year-old Sandown marketing manager climb and descend the same route until the cumulative gain is equivalent to the height of Everest. Starting at the clock on Ventnor Seafront, the challenge will see Tim cycle to the radar station at the top of Down Lane around 38 times in order to reach his 8,848 metre target. Within the inner circle of long distance cycling, this is on many people's bucket list, said Tim, who's no relation to his famous namesake Bradley. I've always liked Ventnor, it has beautiful views. Tim has completed several ultra-distance races, include, including cycling from Falmouth to London in 24 hours. He's raising money for the Ellen MacArthur Trust, the Ireland-based charity that empowers young people recovering from cancer through sailing. The activities help build self-confidence vital to long-term recovery. Tim said, One more, on a more personal note, I lost my granddad to cancer and he was very much the person who got me into sailing. So this seems like a very apt charity to support and I want to give something back to the community. Devolution deals still on the agenda for the Isle of Wight. Devolution deals will be back on the table in the next few days. The Tory leader of the Isle of Wight Council revealed he would be meeting the leaders of Southampton and Portsmouth City Councils and Hampshire County Council to discuss, discuss whether devolution could or should proceed. Previous schemes put forward by the leader of Hampshire County Council and by the City Council stalled despite government encouragement and the promise of a cash incentive. Councillor Dave Stewart, who is also a member of the Solent Local Enterprise Partnership, which has representatives of all the regional councils on it, told last week's Isle of Wight Council Scrutiny Committee meeting his group did not meeting his group did not consider previous devolution proposals to have been in the best interests of the island. One of my colleagues has produced a very full document which will be sent to all three leaders so they can understand our rationale, he said. He said his group was not against the ideas in principle and there was already collaborative working in several areas. KFC restaurant plan for Lake. Fast food giant Kentucky Fried Chicken wants to open a drive through restaurant in Lake which would create up to 50 new jobs. KFC has submitted a planning application for an 80-seat restaurant with 37 parking spaces on land behind Merry Gardens Pub and next to the Premier Inn off Newport Road. According to the application, around 600 residents and businesses in the area were consulted earlier this year and 52% were in favour. Respondents welcomed the new jobs but raised concerns about potential traffic congestion, littering, food smells, noise and antisocial behaviour. In response, KFC said its policy was to carry out litter picks at least four times a day. It said there would be CCTV coverage and a close working relationship with the police and that noise generated at the restaurant would not adversely affect residents. It said our odour problems would be mitigated by our innovative extractor system. As over half the respondents recognised, it is considered there is a real need for a new KFC restaurant, of which nothing of its kind currently exists in the area. Lake Parish Council backed the plans at its meeting on Wednesday, and the provisos improvements uh, with the provisos improvements are made to the roundabout at Merry Gardens to allow better visibility, 
that litter picking is covered over a wide range radius and that ecological issues such as the local badger population and Scotchells Brook are protected. Speaking at the meeting, Lake resident John Marshall said, although he supported creation for more jobs for the area, he was concerned about littering and suggested the company employ an extra person specifically to deal with litter. KFC has another outlet in Newport. Its former restaurant in Union Street Ride closed in December 2012. And with that, it's goodbye from Imelda. Have a lovely weekend, cooler and pleasant. And goodbye from Anne with the same hope that you enjoy your weekend. Good morning, I'm Stephen. And I'm Terry. And we'll be reading the features section of the County Press today, starting off with a letter from your new MP, Mr Bob Seeley. Headlined, My Pledge to Fight for White. With the dust having now settled on the general election, I thought now would be a good time to write. I would like to thank all those islanders who voted on June the 8th. My role now as your Member of Parliament is to represent every islander regardless of how they voted and indeed whether they voted and give them an influential voice in Westminster. Since the election, many local residents have been in touch and I am grateful to them for their patience as my office is being set up. This will take a couple more weeks as premises are found, staff hired and the parliamentary and data protection permissions are obtained. All these are in hand and are being done as swiftly as possible. For the time being, constituents can get in touch through bob.seeley.mp at parliament.uk, which will be the main email point of contact. My temporary office number is 07539173481. I am having surgeries whenever they are needed, but we will soon publish a list of surgery dates. Some of these will be in Newport, but many will be around the island. I would like to briefly set out my approach to being the island's MP. My job is to listen to islanders before exercising my judgement in how best to represent our interests in Westminster. I recognise I will not please everyone, such is the diversity of opinion in our community. However, I intend to promote our interests in a manner which is most likely to deliver real outcomes for the island. I am not a one-person protest group. I will decide which battles to fight, taking a stand on the issues that matter most locally in order to make a difference. An obvious example of this is the meeting I held this week with a government minister about the future of Sandown Bay Academy, a crucial issue for East White. I will do everything I can, working with the Isle of Wight Council, to help secure the future of high quality secondary provision in this location. Our country faces some tough challenges ahead. At the time of writing, we are seeing the aftermath of extremists targeting innocent people in our cities. We have also witnessed the Grenfell Tower disaster. The emergency response to such incidents is rapid, but the political response must be measured. With emotions running high, we must ensure the facts are established, recommendations are put forward and changes are made. We must maintain a strong economy to generate funding to support the vital work of our emergency services and the armed forces, as well as public services at large. The future of our economy and our trading relationship will be a key part of the Brexit negotiations now underway. I will be taking a keen interest in these, ensuring that we not only secure a good outcome for our country, but one that best serves the needs of our island. The Isle of Wight will always be my focus, and I will continue to champion it with the tenacity it deserves. And there's a letter here from Angela Booth from East Cows about the need for a bridge review. The Isle of Wight Council must take action now and not take us islanders for fools. This floating bridge is a serious failure and cannot be fixed. Or it cannot be fixed without making the situation much worse, such as fewer crossings, stopping crossings at low tide and other insurmountable issues. You don't need an engineering degree to see there's only one sheltered pedestrian cabin instead of two and a very slowly unloading open-top double-decker 
and pedestrians are now health and safety guinea pigs, forced to enter and exit East Cow's North Highway, where lorries mount that pavement and cars nearly miss a death corner. Most islanders assessed at a glance the bridge is too long, too wide, too tall and too heavy. With improper disabled and pram access, prows too short, missing adequate flood defences and a host of other issues, the council must admit now these aren't teething issues but massive irreparable design flaws. Almost every possible solution creates a new problem. For example, putting longer fingers on the prows makes the bridge longer a problem at low tide and can obstruct the operator's visibility and or make it more difficult for yachts to pass. The council cannot say this bridge is acceptable. Cars cannot snake off slowly, nor should a new bridge not run during neap solstice tides. The last bridge only stopped twice a year at the worst tides, not every low tide. This floating bridge was to be better and have increased crossings and reduced queuing times, as clearly outlined as objectives by the funder, the Solent Local Enterprise Partnership, uh, known as LEP. The LEP cited the bridge as a critical piece of transport infrastructure for the island, not just for cows and east cows, responsible and necessary for less congestion in and around Newport, Instead, this bridge is worse. The Isle of Wight Council has a responsibility to help businesses and the economy, and another Solent LEP floating bridge objective prioritises supporting the economic well-being of the towns. Instead, it is killing our town. The Council was informed. The public floating bridge staff and engineers warned council officers and members many times about these probable catastrophes for years. Instead, the council assumed it knew how the bridge is used and it made very poor decisions without any public consultation. We need all barriers to Medina crossing re removed now, including financial People only use a bridge if it is reliable and quick to load and unload, and therefore goes back and forth often. With a bad bridge, and the charges as well, we're losing everyone. The pedestrian charges were set up with shoddy calculations and still are not making the level of profit the council pretends, particularly with the large amount the council pays Southern Vectis for pensioners who use their free bus passes to go around instead. It's also a horrific health and safety issue in East Cows forcing pedestrians to queue in order to charge them. We East Cow's businesses can't wait months for a review to finish. We don't have regular paychecks like some in County Hall. And we shouldn't, nor should any business, bear the burden for any council project that failed on the drawing board. Now the letter of the week from Derek Newton of Binstead, headlined, Well, Blow Me Down. Something I've been left quite speechless by recently, and something in which I'm sure many readers will silently agree on, is the power of hand dryers. I went to Gunwharf Keys with my wife at the weekend, and left astounded by the force at which one of their hand dryers operated. It was imposing waves in the flesh of my hands as I moved them about. This shocked me. Are they safe? I would imagine they are, but I have more questions than answers. The best hand dryer I've come across is on the island at the Bargeman's Rest in Newport. It has a timer that counts down from 15 seconds. When it reaches zero, my hands are, aren't perfectly dry, yet by the time I return to my table, I can still grip my cutlery with minimal slip. I do wonder if this tour de force will end when we leave the EU, who have needlessly limited the power of hoovers and washing machines in the past year or so. If this is the case, and our hand dryers can match Gunworth keys in strength, then I won't be sad for our neighbours from the North Island. And from Alan Priddle in Cows, a letter entitled Orange Flashing Things. 
Why is it so many drivers just don't bother to indicate when changing lanes or on a roundabout? Is it because they can't be bothered? Or have they forgotten where their indicator is? Is it they are lazy? Or they know where they're going, so why bother letting anyone else know? Also, every day I see people texting and using mobile phones while driving. Can the police use unmarked cars and catch this dangerous lot? Now a letter from Alan Brown of Ride, headlined Fly Tipping has spread to charity offices. Charities are witnessing a massive amount of fly tipping under the guise of donations. I am a lowly two-day-a-week volunteer munchkin who sorts the donations at our main sorting and distributing warehouse and yesterday alone sorted incomplete toys, odd and chipped plates, faulty electrical goods, clothes which had obviously been used to decorate, covered in paint. The list is endless during my break today. I sought shade in a little used side of the building and found two bin bags full of obvious domestic waste. I have to spend approximately 50% of my time sorting through rubbish. And don't forget the mountain of rubbish sacks we have to pay for that take up valuable space and need to be taken to the recycling depot, taking up one of our two vans. We have to make a tip run daily now. It could be just coincidence that it coincided with Amy's new rules. I would never discourage people from donating. Good donations are a lifeline to our charity. From Dennis Rumbold in Lake, uh, details about a school reunion. I am arranging a reunion for all who attended the Fairway Secondary Modern School. It is taking place on Saturday the 4th of August 2018 at Sandown and Shanklin Rugby Club. I have set the date some time in advance so those people who have emigrated have the opportunity to make arrangements to attend. The reunion is for anyone who went to this school before it became a comprehensive in 1970. It is not for those who only attended Sandown High School. I have set up a Facebook page, Fairway Secondary Modern Reunion 2018. Please join the group if you're interested. If you're not on Facebook, you can email me fairway18 at mail.com to let me know of your interest in attending. And for those who do not use a computer, please contact me at my home address, uh, but uh, the alternative would be or by phone on this number, 077-59614. And now a letter from Andrew Fessy, a class teacher at Barton Primary School in Newport, headlined, Wolfgard made pupils so happy. We would like to thank the Isle of Wight Viking enactment group, Wolfgard. The children of Barton were led through an amazing Viking enactment experience by the volunteers prior to their recent Calborn Mill event. Many thanks to the mill for allowing the pupils access. Here are some of the children's thoughts. I enjoyed a lot of the facts and I never knew the Vikings used to live on the Isle of Wight. To prepare we made Viking shields and at home we got together a Viking costume for the group. Thanks for having our school and I hope one day we can come back. It was spectacular. The thing I enjoyed most was before we were about to leave we got together and had a huge battle. Robert Drover in Freshwater writes a letter concerning the safety of trees. I recently carried out a survey of ivy-clad trees on roadsides in West White. It was disturbing to find that approximately 8 to 10 percent of trees showed signs of decay and 1, 2 percent of those checked, is now subject to removal action. Extrapolating from this, it appears that there is a huge problem island-wide. It is time for action as a matter of urgency as they are a danger to road users. And now the looking back column, starting 100 years ago on June the 23rd 1917. Two conscientious objectors were put before a Sandown military tribunal in unusual circumstances. 
The two men, both of Albert Road and Shanklin, had asked for exemption based on the grounds of employment with British Oil and Cake Mills Limited. Upon arriving in Bristol as labourers, they deemed the area of the town where they were living to be unhealthy, so had returned to the island. And a gruesome discovery was made in Dodner when the body of a newborn baby girl was found in a field near Dodner Lane, Parkhurst. Fanny Jeffrey of Flux Court, Newport, said she was at the corner of Dodner Lane, near the workhouse, when she saw a little brown paper parcel lying close against the ditch. She opened the parcel to discover the child, which was then handed over to the authorities. The coroner concluded there was no information available to identify the baby or who had left the body, so the inquiry was adjourned in order for the police to complete their inquiries. 75 years ago, from the county press on the 27th of June 1942, the borough of Newport launched a salvage campaign and said bones were urgently required and vital for the war effort. They have no known substitute and are 100% usable. Apparently 50,000 tonnes a year of bones were wasted. The council offered half a pence per pound of bones delivered to its depot. They were used for making glue to be used in the aircraft industry. And a soldier received no fewer than 15 fractures resulting in his untimely death following a lorry accident at Quar Hill. Private John F. Weller was driving a three-ton lorry towards Ryde. He had attempted to overtake a bus and in doing so, part of the hood of the lorry grazed a telephone post which had caught Private Alfred Charles Knight on the shoulder and swung him into the path of the lorry. And 50 years ago, on June 24, 1967, the old fire station in Bembridge was given a new lease of life after going out of service in 1965 following 33 years of service and plans to convert the building into a village library were approved by the County Library and Museums community. The conversion was estimated to cost £775, which is £12,908 in today's money. And bigger and better than the first two, that was what was promised to visitors at the third annual Industries Fair, which opened at Ryde Airport. The 19-day event was planned to showcase the island's notable industrial facilities. The fair was opened by Lord Ashburton, Lord Lieutenant of Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. 25 years ago, on June the 26th, 1992, the report here, a new slip road was a source of controversy with Medina Borough Council wishing to name it after committee chairman Eric Pickford against the wishes of Medina. When the unofficial highway sign appeared, it seemed unclear who was going to take responsibility for it. It was reported Mr Pickford chuckled when he heard of the official sign, but saw nothing to laugh about over Medina's refusal to call the new slip road after him. The county planned to challenge the decision in the magistrate's court. And ten years ago, on June 23, 2007, road safety experts were not allowed to stand at the entrance to a Sandown nightclub to deliver their anti-drink driving message because the club owner feared it would put people off drinking. The Isle of Wight Council road safety team launched their campaign involving offering clubbers half-price bus tickets and asking people how they were getting home. Part of the campaign involved showing a short, sharp DVD on screens within island clubs showing the consequences of drink driving. However, the nightclub owner at Colonel Bogies declined the offer, saying it would put people off drinking in the club. And the cost of an investigation into Undercliff Drive was expected to spiral to more than 330,000. That would be 420,000 pounds today. Investigators sought to establish why proper tendering was not undertaken to award millions of pounds of Undercliff Drive work to engineering consultants High Point Rendell and why, after it had been recognised, procedures had not been followed. Time now for White Memories. A Brave Lad Remembered Colin Weeks got that feeling in the pit of his stomach he had done something very wrong 
when he was summoned by his father, the town mayor Henry, into the town hall parlour. But he was to receive the news the Ride Auxiliary Fire Service was in need of a clerk. The role was to extend to that of motorcycle messenger, spending uncomfortable nights bunked up in a temporary wartime station in the Stainers Dairy Yard off Edward Street, which has now been developed into housing. Then he became a fully-fledged and proud fireman. In his diary, he recorded his reasons for joining up. It was not an example of a, a patriot doing his little bit for king and country, far from it. I was hard up, earning a meagre allowance of five shillings, 25 pence of course now, a week, and I was now offered the imposing figure of one pound. One of his first shouts was to deal with several incendiary bombs dropped upon Ride Airport. All manner of vehicles were pressed into service. Often Colin and his colleagues loaded hose and a 30-foot extension ladder onto the bed of a trailer pump-towing vehicle, which by day served as a coal lorry. It proceeded in a somewhat haphazard fashion, Colin and his colleagues gripping tightly to anything that would stop them falling from the sideless truck. Twenty minutes after the sirens waited, a stick of bombs and thousands of incendiaries were dropped in the St John's Park area of Ryde. Colin and fellow firefighters were greeted by blazes raging from Apley Farm to the foot of East Hill Road. St John's Lodge was among buildings gutted by one of the fires. Colin wrote, The public had still regarded us as three pounds a week army dodgers and we were often referred to as the army of dart players. Overnight, the position changed and we were proud to walk the street in fire service uniform, conscious the hours of training were not in vain. St John's was also thumped by 16 high explosive bombs and incendiaries in December 1940. Colin was again involved. There was also Christmas camaraderie. Jonah, the cook general of our gang, an undertaker by trade but a damned good cook despite his professional calling, was seen riding the tradesman's bicycle down the drive with a large galvanised bath perched precariously on the handlebars. The turkey had arrived. The next month he witnessed the horrific spectacle of 25,000 incendiaries unleashed on Portsmouth. As Colin service extended into the summer of 1941, the remaining pages were thinning until the reader eventually reaches the final unfinished sentence. I made my way, panting and sweating, down Church Street, pulling my machine over the glass. No more was written. Colin and Herbert were to lose their lives a year later in the worst raid to hit the island. The crew of the Polish destroyer, Bliskavitska, moored alongside the jetty at J. Samuel White's shipyard, mounted the famous defence of cows and east cows against the biggest German raid. It was all hands to the pumps and firefighters were mobilised from all over the island, including Raid. Hospitals were choked with casualties and the fire service lost three appliances. Four firemen died when a house in Cambridge Road collapsed on them as they tried to save lives. Only three people, including a three-year-old girl, were pulled from a bomb shelter alive. Twenty died, including her father, who had shielded her with a cuddle. It was the second wave of the attack which was first signalled at 3.30am that was to claim the lives of the blackened and exhausted Herbert and Colin. They were in a WVS van at the southern end of Clarence Road with the redoubtable Miss, Mrs Han who had been serving up hot sweet tea when a bomb slammed a direct hit. A Royal Observer Corps officer on Mount Joy noted with a sense of beautiful irony that through the waves of attack and while he witnessed the destruction of much of two communities from a distance, the Nightingale's song never ceased. Colin is buried in Ride Cemetery with his father, who died 13 years after his son. And Colin Week's diary has been loaned by Ride Fire Station with a selection of other brigade memorabilia to be displayed at Ride District Heritage Centre in the Royal Victoria Arcade. Now we'll have a look at my view from Malcolm Mime. I didn't bother to vote, and here's why. 
When I agreed to write a monthly column for the county press, I made a list of a whole range of topics that I wanted to write about. But so far I don't seem to have gotten past politics. I did think about avoiding politics this month, but as I haven't written a column since the general election, I can't really ignore it. So it's another political one with particular reference to the voting system. I didn't vote on June the 8th, not because I have no interest in politics, which I obviously do, and not because I couldn't be bothered or didn't have the time. There were a number of reasons I didn't vote, but it was mainly because A. I simply couldn't find a candidate or party who represented my views, and B. I knew the Tory candidate would have a landslide victory, so felt that my vote was worthless. A number of people have told me it is wrong not to vote, and we are lucky to live in a democracy that allows it. But although I agree it is important we have the right to vote, it is down to the individual as to whether or not they exercise that right, and I chose not to. I wasn't alone in not voting. <laughs> there were 14 million of us in the UK, more than voted Conservative, including 36,000 fellow islanders. Research by cable.co.uk has shown 42% of those who didn't vote would have if they had been able to do it online from the comfort of their own home. If this is the case, then surely online voting has to come in, so more of the electorate is engaged. Although I am not a Tory, I have social conscience, so I can't be, I feel no frustration at the result of the election, either nationally or locally, because democracy has declared the Conservative Party is the most popular. A number of people have been declaring our election system is unfair and if we had proportionate representation, PR, instead of first-past-the-post, then the outcome of the election would have been different. The Isle of Wight Green Party candidate, Vic Slothian, has even taken to the BBC's Sunday Politics show to point out under a PR voting system the Green Party would have 11 MPs instead of just one. Likewise, the Liberal Democrats have been shouting that under a PR system they would have 48 seats instead of 12. But what neither the Greens nor the Lib Dems have said, which uh, is which constituencies these MPs would represent, it's all very well Vix Lothian thinking she should be a Member of Parliament based on the overall national vote for the Green Party, but where would her seat be? Certainly not on the Isle of Wight, where she wasn't even the second most popular candidate. Under a PR system, we would end up having MPs representing areas they have no connection to, just like we have at the moment with the members of the European Parliament, who are elected under a PR system. There are currently 10 MEPs representing the South East of England, which includes the Isle of Wight, but as far as I'm aware not one of them has any connection to the island, let alone lives here, and I wouldn't have a clue which one of the ten to contact if I needed to. In fact, with the exception of Nigel Farage, I couldn't even name any of them. I may not have found anyone to vote for, and some might not think our voting system is fair, but at least the party with the most votes is in government, so democracy has prevailed, and we islanders know which individual is answerable to us if those pledges he made turn out to be lies. And then a column by Rebecca Roncoroni, headlined, What Price Can Be Put on Human Life? No one can fail to be horrified by the Grenfell Tower fire. The sheer magnitude of the tragedy, the human lives lost and lives ruined, has been appalling. But then, to our stunned disbelief, we are told it was preventable. It should never have happened. This tower was built without adequate fire escapes in the full knowledge fire rescue equipment could never reach the top floors. No sprinklers and cheap flammable cladding was used to tart up the outside. This is not a case of being a bit careless. This is risking human lives on the probability that bad things won't happen. To refurbish a building utilising materials that are allegedly banned all over Europe, 
and the USA, and if Philip Hammond is to be believed in the UK on the Andrew Marr programme on Sunday morning, because of their fire risk is not just a bit dodgy, it is carrying out work in the full knowledge what they are doing could be fatal. What kind of psychopath took the final decision to go ahead with the cheap cladding to save a grand total of £5,000, knowing that if fire broke out, people would die as a direct consequence? Why was it seemingly more important to tart up Grenfell Tower on the outside and ignore the very real safety upgrades the building needed? If you view money simply as a token we exchange with each other for goods and services, the question has to be asked, why has this token and the accumulation of it become more important than human life, integrity, compassion, truth, justice, decency and civilised behaviour? How have we come to a time when money outstrips any desire or requirement to behave as a caring society, which looks after its vulnerable in the knowledge that when they become old and vulnerable, they too will be looked after? How is it a person working full time on minimum wage can't afford to support themselves? How is it okay that corporate welfare, i.e. tax credits, are seen as a better choice, by and for whom, than giving people the respect of paying them a decent living wage rather than bolstering the bank accounts of their shareholders? How do you place a value on someone's time? How is it a nurse is worth less than £100 per day, but a business consultant can charge £1,200? Who decides a day in one person's life is worth 12 times more than another's. We're all animals with a limited lifespan. Your seconds are just as valuable as anyone else's. Why are we looking at the financial cost of giving people medical treatment rather than the human cost to us as a civilization if people aren't given that treatment? How can we place a higher value on tokens than on life? Where has it all gone so wrong? This is not a political rant, it's more of a philosophical one. What kind of society do we actually want to live in? What are the values we want underpinning our civilization? What are we prepared to do about it? Are we capable at taking an objective look at what is needed in order for us to function as a healthy, fair society? Can we just forget politics and egos and just work together for the good of us all? And now we go behind the news uh, with Richard Wright who talks to the winners in the Ventnor Botanics Photography Contest. The beauty of Ventnor Botanic Garden through the seasons has been captured by island photographers. The images, 130 in all, proved it is possible in this digital age to take prize-winning pictures without hugely expensive gear. The winner of several top prizes, including Best Overall Picture, confirmed that. Ian Pratt has more or less retired from his day job as a solicitor and has more time to pursue his long-time hobby of wildlife photography. And an image of one of Ventnor's famous wall lizards won him the wildlife section. But when he turned his attention to the garden's flora, an attention-grabbing picture of the national flower of South Africa, a King Protea, emerged. It struck judges with its vivid architectural beauty. Garden volunteer Ian, 65, from Ride, said, Only one of my entries was taken with a digital SLR, a single lens reflex, that is. All the rest of the photographs, including the best overall, were taken with my little Lumix. It just shows good pictures can be got without long lenses and lots of gear. The contest, which was sponsored in part by the county press, was judged by professional photographers Julian Winslow and Steve Blamire, alongside Dimbola Museum and Gallery's curator Rachel Tate. Part of the prize for the winners was professional printing of the images by David Wistens, who praised the composition of the range of entries. He said, I think they really have done the garden justice. Garden volunteer Bridget Sibick used her Canon Compact to snap prize-winning images, including an eye-catching study of a leaf which won the abstract prize. Jonathan Hill, maybe 82, 
but the volunteer showed youthful verve to enter 12 pictures and scoop the landscape prize. Linda Richardson and her daughter, 16-year-old Ariella from Knighton, took prizes too. Linda said, The garden is a special place. I come here all the time, and it is thanks to the volunteers who keep it going. The contest was organised by Rosemary Stewart, who said, The contest only raised a modest amount for the garden's friends, but I think it also raised awareness of what a beautiful place it is. One prize winner, first placed and runner-up in the young photographer category, was 17-year-old Olivia Williams, who was unable to attend. A-level photography student Olivia, who's from Twickenham, entered an atmospheric shot of the water feature close to where her granddad was working. She has followed in the artistic footsteps of Alex from Bembridge, who was the garden's artist in residence last year. Now let's have a look at what's on over the coming couple of weeks and get out those blue suede shoes for Saturday 1st of July rock and roll special Jive Street supported by DJ Dr Jive um, get your tickets early it says tickets nine pounds and this is to be held at the Riverside Center in Newport seven till late doors open at seven o'clock no admittance after 11 p.m. And if you'd like further information on that, there are two numbers you can phone. Either Shirley on 52767 Nought or Graham on 404773. And now Ghost Train arrives at Apollo. A play penned by the late Arnold Ridley, best known as Bumbling Private Godfrey in the classic series Dad's Army, has been chosen as the Apollo player's next production. The Ghost Train is set in the waiting room of a remote railway station and follows the fortunes of a disparate group of travellers, including a pair of newlyweds, a bickering middle-aged couple and an elderly spinster concerned for the welfare of her parrot. Stranded until the next train arrives in the morning, they dismiss the station master's tale of a ghostly train and, deciding to make the best of it, they settle down for a quiet night. It turns out to be anything but, as more and more people arrive in the dead of night. Is the ghost train just a figment of the villagers' imaginations? Will the travellers resolve the differences between them? Where does the strange woman come from and has she really seen the ghost train? What about the ghostly station master who's supposed to haunt the station? There are mysteries to solve, some light-hearted moments, and more than one twist in the tale. The Ghost Train will be at the Apollo Theatre in Newport from Friday June the 30th to Saturday July the 8th, excluding Sunday and Monday. Tickets are available from the box office or online at www.apollo-theatre.org.uk slash the ghost train. We really have a feast of nostalgia having had the jiving then the ghost train. We've also got, on the 2nd of July, Vintage and Classic Motor Show. The Vectis Historic Vehicle Club have organised it at Arriton Barnes from 11 in the morning till 4 in the afternoon. That's, as I said, the 2nd of July. And you're invited to join us with your classic or vintage vehicle. Bring the family to see cars of yesteryear. Um, and it says it's a plaque for the first 250 vehicles, stalls and Grand Tombola. Plenty going on. So if you haven't got a vehicle, just go along and enjoy it. I should be there, certainly. Um, entry, £3 per car and trike. £2 per motorbike. Public £2 each. Public parking free. And children accompanied by adults free. That's between 0 and 16 years. And all proceeds are to the hospice, the old Mountbatten hospice. And now news of a showcase for young Isle of Wight talent. Some of the Isle of Wight and Hampshire's most exciting up-and-coming bands will be performing in Ride next week. Headlining the event at the Black Sheep Bar in Ride is Goo Lagoon, the recording project of 18-year-old Fox Roding, following the release of his debut self-titled EP earlier this year. 
The event takes place on Thursday. Southampton alt-rock five-piece elements, who have supported the likes of Dead and Public Service Broadcasting, are the special guests of the night. Isle of Wight indie rock outfits Eaton Girls Choir and Avocado Sunrise are also on the bill. The event, run by Atmos Music, will also see the launch of the lineup for its collaboration with fellow Isle of Wight promoters Rocket Fuel Magazine, happening at Strings Bar and Venue in Newport in July. Doors for the Black Sheep gig open at 7.30pm. Also on July the 1st, next Saturday, the Isle of Wight Symphony Orchestra will perform the final concert of Medina Theatre's orchestral series. It promises to be a treat. Debussy's magnificent La Mer forms the dramatic centrepiece of a programme entirely inspired by the sea. It is a richly evocative depiction and a masterpiece of Impressionism. Conductor Jonathan Butcher continues to introduce rarely performed works. Ethel Smythe's overture, The Wreckers, was inspired by the actions of notorious 19th century Cornish villagers who lured ships onto the rocks, plundering them of their cargo. Klaus Bardet's much-loved music from Pirates of the Caribbean is sure to be popular with the audience, as will Henry Wood's uplifting Fantasia on British Sea Songs, performed annually at the last night of the proms. Also on the programme is Percy Granger's inspired arrangement of the Irish folk melody Molly on the Shore and Vorjak's scintillating carnival overture. The evening begins at 7.15pm and, as at all its concerts this year, the orchestra will be supporting the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Air Ambulance. And the Manor is the new venue for the Classical Music Festival, Classic Isle, which returns for its third year and has a new home at Barton Manor, which will serve as the backdrop for the Intimate Classical Music Festival. This year will feature VIP marquees with access to a Pims and Champagne bar in the Secret Garden, complete with sofas and table service. Lawn tickets are also available, perfect for a picnic, plus unrestricted access to the expansive grounds of Barton, which are not usually open to the public. The festival runs between 4pm and 10pm on Saturday and Sunday, July the 8th and 9th. All tickets must be acquired in advance. For details, visit www.classicisle.com. The artists appearing include the Royal Marines Association Band. Formed in 2006, the band comprises 50 retired Royal Marine bandsmen and women. Katie Marshall. At only 15, Katie is a rising star in the classical music world. First inspired by the Phantom of the Opera, Katie has won fans around the world for a remarkable soprano voice. Michael Durant Michael began playing the guitar aged four and has since established himself as one of the most exciting instrumentalists of the current generation, thanks in part to his special handmade instrument. And the Bingham String Quartet The quartet has gained an international reputation for their interpretation of the classical repertoire. And finally, Morgan Szymanski Performs, performances as a solo guitarist and with orchestras have taken Morgan to concert halls and festivals around the world. And one uh, longer running event for this summer, Summer School 2017 is called. Key Arts 13th Annual Summer School takes place this August with a wide range of workshops for all levels of expertise. This year we have an inspiring selection of courses and workshops to tempt you, including textiles, drawing, painting and jewellery making. And for full details on all workshops, pick up a summer school brochure from the box office or phone 822 and uh, we must just apologise for any extraneous noises during the talking news this week, as we've had the windows open to keep the temperature down. And that's all from us for this week, so it's goodbye from Terry. And it's goodbye from Stephen. Bye.
This is Chris. And this is Pauline. Reading out the questions for the client consultation survey. This is advanced information in order to give you more time to consider your responses. Client consultation. Established in 1895, the Isle of Wight Society for the Blind, IWSB, is one of the oldest independent charities on the Isle of Wight. We are inviting clients and prospective clients to have their say and identify their priorities in a consultation exercise that will help determine Isle of Wight Society for the Blind future plans and activities. Our continuing purpose is to provide practical, emotional and educational support for visually impaired people, their families and carers and promote awareness of the needs of those affected by sight loss amongst the general public. We strive to help people maintain independence, learn new skills and participate in social, physical and educational activities to reduce loneliness and isolation. Currently we organise weekly coffee mornings, educational talks and seminars, craft clubs, weekly swimming sessions, walking and golf, a visiting and befriending service, a weekly audio version of the Isle of Wight County Press and a library of audio books. To help ensure the services we provide in the future meet the needs of our existing and potential clients, the Society will use the survey to guide and develop our strategic plans. With your help, we can ensure that our resources are targeted wisely to meet your needs. Thank you very much for participating in this survey. Your feedback is invaluable in guiding our future. Do you currently use any of the services supported by the Isle of Wight Society for the Blind? Your answer is either yes or no. If you answered no, please go to question three. If you answered yes, please rate how positive each have on your well-being under the following. And the headings are not applicable, not at all, slightly positive, moderately positive, very positive, extremely positive. This is Strollers Walking Group, Dolphin Swimming Group, Millbrook House Weekly Coffee Morning. Bembridge Monthly Coffee Morning. Knighton Monthly Coffee Morning. Freshwater Monthly Coffee Morning. Owls, Millbrook House, Meeting with Guest Speaker. Knitters and Natterers, Social Group at Millbrook House. Striders Walking Group. Talking News. Audio Library. Newsletter. Millbrook House Resource Room of Aids and Equipment for the Visually Impaired. Millbrook House Braille Document Production. Millbrook House as a point of contact for information for the visually impaired. Isle of Wight Society for the Blind Volunteer Home Visit Service. Opportunities to volunteer for IWSB. The Golf Group. And the Ten Pin Bowling Group. Please rate how positive an impact the following services might have on your well-being if IWSB were able to coordinate them for clients. As with our existing provision, the Society covers any general administrative, organisational costs and room use at Millbrook House. Categories are, and we'd like you to say not at all, or slightly positive, moderately positive, very positive, extremely positive, age appropriate exercise classes such as yoga, other sport or activity taster days. Support to participate in a sponsored challenge event, e.g. the Isle of Wight Cycle Challenge, walk, run, marathon, skydive, etc. to raise awareness and funds for the society. Craft taster sessions. Monthly food and drink tasting group with sessions at Millbrook House. Monthly food and drink tasting group with sessions at other venues. Quarterly day trips to Isle of Wight heritage sites or tourist attractions. Quarterly day trips to the mainland heritage sites or tourist attractions. Holidays and short breaks organised by the Society, supported with the provision of sighted volunteers to assist with guiding, not care provision. 
monthly music group to include singing, listening and occasional concert or live performance visits. Quarterly storytelling or poetry recital group, your chance to spin a good yarn or share favourite poems. Social activities closer to your home. Introduction to technology course of perhaps six weekly sessions looking at computers, iPads, mobile phones and apps for the visually impaired. Monthly technology group to keep abreast of development in computers, iPads, mobile phones and apps for the visually impaired. Quarterly technology group to keep abreast of development in computers, iPads, mobile phones and apps for the visually impaired. Evening stroke weekend social group for 65 plus year olds. Evening weekend social group for 50 to 64 year olds. Evening weekend social group for 36 to 49 year olds. Evening weekend social group for 19 to 35 year olds. Evening social activities for young people aged 16 to 18 years. Evening social club for 11 to 15 year olds. Evening social club for 7 to 10 year olds. Quarterly evening social meeting at Millbrook House for parents, guardians, carers of young people with visual impairment with separate activities arranged for any accompanying young people. School summer holiday activities or social event for visually impaired young people and their parents, guardians or carers. Dancing. Please add any further suggestions of services or activities you would like the Society to provide. Other suggestions. Please suggest any sport or activities you would like to try. Please identify the challenge event or activity you would be interested in. Please suggest any craft activities you would like to try. Please indicate here the styles of music you would enjoy. In relation to social and recreational activities, please indicate whether you would generally prefer activities targeted and arranged specifically for those with visual impairment or activities that are open to both sighted and visually impaired people where reasonable adjustments are made to accommodate the particular needs of the visually impaired. Visual impairment aside, on a scale of 0 to 10, where 10 is very healthy, how healthy do you feel at the moment? Being connected is more than having a network of friends and family. It could include being connected to your community, having the ability to access services or help when you need it and being digitally connected. On a scale of 0 to 10, where 10 is very connected, how connected to others do you feel? On a scale of 0 to 10, where 10 is very confident, how confident are you using technology, the internet in everyday life? For example, using email, the internet, social media, online banking, shopping, etc. How do you find out about the following? The headings are printed leaflets or posters, word of mouth, Isle of Wight Society for the Blind website, other internet, social media, radio, talking news or other and then please specify. Local events, social activities. Contact details for organisations and services for the visually impaired. Health information relating to sight loss. Other health services and information. And travel. About Isle of Wight Society for the Blind. What, if anything, do you know about Isle of Wight Society for the Blind? How would you describe Isle of Wight Society for the Blind to others? Would you favour a name change of the society to promote a more inclusive organisation that supported those with visual impairment, for example, Isle of Wight Vision?
Your answer is yes or no. Would you like to suggest a new working name for the Society that would reflect a more inclusive and forward-looking ethos? Please remember that this survey and all responses are completely anonymous. Information gathered is purely to enable us to better understand the needs of visually impaired islanders to inform our future plans and services. Please indicate which age range you are in. Under 10 years. 11 to 15 years. 16 to 18 years. 19 to 35 years. 36 to 49 years, 50 to 64 years, 65 to 74 years, 75 to 84 years, 85 plus years, or you've the option prefer not to say. What is your gender? What is your current status? Please tick all that apply. Are you a full-time student of any age? A part-time student of any age? Employed? Homemaker? Unemployed? Semi-retired? Or retired? Do you volunteer for any organisation? Yes? No? Prefer not to say? If yes, which organisation? Please tell us the first part, that is the four digits, of your postcode. Please let us have any comments, questions or concerns. Please identify if you have completed this and independently, firstly as a visually impaired client or prospective client, or as a volunteer, carer, guardian or visually impaired parent. Thank you for completing this survey. This is a download from the BBC. For more information and our terms of use, go to www.bbc.co.uk forward slash in touch. Tonight, facing retirement, we'll be hearing from a man who thinks it poses different challenges when you're visually impaired. And in a moment, he'll be telling us why. And to make sure she reaches retirement, Emma Tracy has been learning to defend herself. Back away, leave me alone. Help, if you're actually holding this cane up, they're showing people, because when it was folded in, yeah. nobody could see it. It was right. just you and him. So it's close. kind of up at my face. So if you're holding it up, time. people can see there's a cane. More from Emma later. But first, Mike Kelly is a civil servant, at least until next week. But he recently got in touch with us looking for advice from other listeners about how to approach retirement. Although he's comfortable in the job that he's been doing for 30 years, at almost 65 he feels it's time to try something new, but he isn't sure whether he's as well equipped for retirement as he was for his job. He's been explaining his situation to me. I think that retirement is a sort of daunting prospect for anybody, really, because, you know, when you go to school, you're educated to get some qualifications, get a good job. And then in my day, it was save up for a mortgage and a house. So we've done that. But you're not educated at all after leaving work. But I think if you have a serious disability like blindness, then there's more things to take into consideration. So in a way, I feel that I'm going to be starting all over again, having to learn new skills, new ways of doing things. I do have some things lined up to do but again it's just not knowing how much is enough and how much is too much for instance just last month i was re-elected onto our local town council in nailsworth uh, wendy my wife and i are national trust members and i'd like to maybe do some work there perhaps maybe even become a room advisor if that's possible i'd like to learn to cook if that's feasible do the gardening take up archery there's lots there, you know, it's, it's a, an open page really, it's just knowing what's possible and what's not. Well, I suppose that, that's what's rather puzzling in a way, in that you do have a lot of ideas, there are a lot of things you want to do, and I suppose what I'm trying to establish is, is it that you're afraid that you won't have the skills to do these things? It may be the skills, but it's just wondering just how accessible some of these places are, and how much I can do independently. For instance, if I do try to do some work with the National Trust, 
for instance, it's being able to maybe get to the local National Trust property by myself. And also, I think I'd probably like to become a room guide, but just wondering if people will be, um, how willing they're going to be to come to me for advice and guidance. But you obviously do have skills because, you know, you work, you obviously do a responsible job. Presumably you need some level of mobility and that kind of thing. And so give, give us a picture of where you are in terms of practical skills. I do have a shaggy guide dog, Danny, at my wacky Labradoodle. But public transport's not very good where we are. I think I did say that I'd like to learn to cook. At the moment, I didn't even know how to use the toaster. I suppose I probably will see if we've got a technical officer in the local social services, if they still exist and how much they can do to help, I don't know. I'd like to be able to do the gardening as well, but I don't know where to find information about how to mow the lawn in a straight line, for example. And is it that really you've been too bound up in your work to acquire some of these skills? I think I've never really had to bother, so I haven't really tried. <laughs> you know, work's a comfortable environment. You know, I know the physical environment, and the easy option would have just been to have stayed there indefinitely, I think, really. But I think, I, you know, I, I feel that I need to set up a new framework and a new structure. That's the kind of comforting side of work, I think, because you know, as well as the people and the familiarity, it's having a bit of a regime and a bit of a structure to life. And if any of your listeners have had experience in starting all over again, starting new life and starting new interests, that would be very, very helpful. Well, we have already heard from some of our listeners, so you might be interested in some of the things they've said. Bill and Gail Guest are a couple who are both totally blind. They say they do voluntary work with guide dogs or the RNIB. Gail teaches Braille. Bill's a member of a choir, and they acknowledge that it can sometimes be difficult to, to get into mainstream organisations, but they they say it can be done with, with persistence. It's just that I was more interested interested in doing some mainstream stuff. In the past, I was a magistrate as well, so I know it is possible to do those things, but it's just sort of seeing what else is available, really. We had an interesting one from uh, William Page, who's got a number of suggestions. First, he says book groups, and he's saying, you know, tell perhaps a dozen people you'll read a specific book and would then like to discuss it over a, a cup of tea in about a month's time. Um, and uh, he says, you know, you hope six or seven will come along and, and do it and then set up the next meeting. Or a similar kind of method with pub lunches. In other words, you get a group oh, yeah, of you're people. Talking. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, the idea being that you get a few people, maybe that are contacts, perhaps in the same boat, perhaps the same age, and simply pass it on from one event to the next. Yeah, book club's a good idea because I like reading. So um, we have some nice pubs locally. So thank you, William. Yeah. Um, what's missing in terms of how you might get this kind of advice? Well, I, I don't think it's a problem as much as kind of you know challenge and looking for opportunities, really. I think the information is out there. It's just that I think you have to be prepared to spend quite a lot of time looking for it and going to the right place and making the contacts. I think that can be difficult. It can be awkward. It can take time. I think it's just a case of... You know, sort of planning, coordinating, finding who to speak to. One thing I am interested in, in that you've suggested to us in conversation before we began the broadcast, that actually being alone in a house can be quite a problem for you. I think most blind people, most people are better with, you know, when they're doing something, when they're active, when they're with people. I find at home that... There are some things that I can do. I can make tea and coffee, I can play with the dogs, do bits of housework and stuff, but I am far better when I'm with people or actively involved in something or out out and about enjoying myself. I'm not very good by myself for long periods of time. Short periods is fine, you know, a bit of downtime is fine, but it's long periods that I would find difficult by myself with nothing to do. Blindness can be very isolating. You can be in the middle of a really busy farm's market, as we were on Saturday in Stroud, with friends, and they all went off to buy various bits and pieces. I was only by myself a moment or two, but it actually can be quite lonely. Everyone else around you sort of talking and enjoying themselves. It can be quite a, a lonely sort of existence, I think, yeah. It, it's quite interesting that you say that actually you don't need to retire it's not a requirement that you do and yet you have chosen to do so and yet on the other hand you're, you're obviously a little bit nervous of its consequences 
Yeah, I think I'm a little bit nervous because it's like starting all over again. It's going to be a new beginning. All these new things I hope start. They're not all going to be successful. Some will fail, I'm sure. It's going to take time learning. And as I get older, you know, things take me longer to learn anyway. As I say, the easiest option would have been to stay at work and carry on in a familiar environment. But I wanted to leave while I still got plenty of time left, hopefully, you know, to, to start a new life. Mike Kelly, thank you. So, as you've heard, we've already received some suggestions for Mike, but we'd like some more. And we also want to hear your experience of the significance of work for visually impaired people lucky enough to be in a job. And why we might be more reluctant than most to leave the comfort of a steady job which we understand and in which our capabilities and competence is recognised by our colleagues. And we stay with jobs because we've been commenting for some time now on the situation where the chief executive posts of the two largest charities for visually impaired people in the UK, Guide Dogs for the Blind Association and RNIB, are occupied by stand-ins. Well, Guide Dogs for the Blind Association has resolved its situation. They've appointed Tom Wright. His background is in care of elderly people with Age UK and Age International. He takes over in September. Meanwhile, the RNIB tells us that Sally Harvey, who had been appointed as acting CEO up until this April, is still in charge while they plan to recruit for a new chief executive later this year. Now, listeners may remember that we reported on the blind man who was tasered by police in Lancashire a couple of months ago because they mistook his folded white cane for a gun. Well, while canes are obviously not deadly weapons, they can be useful in protecting yourself from an attack, or so maintains David Black. David's blind himself and he runs self-defence classes for blind people in Falkirk in Scotland. Emma Tracy from BBC Out went along to find out how he'd learned his techniques and how he goes about passing them on. It's a very rare, scorching hot day here at the Forth Valley Sensory Centre in Falkirk in Scotland and blind and visually impaired people from the local area are trickling in to take part in David Black's self-defence class. There are just three participants today, so everyone will get lots of one-on-one attention. Is it in a cup? When you shoot in a cup? cup. That's it. Excellent. To compress the air into his ear. Yeah. To actually shock him. Even though David had been practising martial arts for quite some time, three unprovoked attacks crushed his confidence so much that he wasn't able to leave the house. He wanted to learn how to protect himself as a blind person and then how to pass it on to other people. You've been into martial arts for quite a long time, haven't you? Yeah, about nine, ten years. Judo, jiu-jitsu and until recently Aikido. And why did you start martial arts in the first place? Because I was scared. Yeah, I was attacked a couple of times. Can you tell me a little bit about that? I was one time somebody nearly flung me in the canal, but I flung him instead. Another time I got tripped up to see how blind I was and uh, the worst one was people just punching me out of nowhere. The Fourth Valley Sensory Centre is really important to David. It's where he went at his lowest point. And they introduced him to Alan Bell from the Scottish Safety Centre. Alan has helped David to turn his martial arts experience into self-defence moves that he can use. Uh, the, the lessons are split up in such a way that the first couple of lessons we deal with the law uh, regarding self-defence, when you can and can't defend yourself, and we also cover reasonable use of force. So David's already done lessons where he's told people about um, what, how much force they can use against a potential attacker. So the things that we've covered today is when an attacker has escalated to someone strangling you, then the amount of force you can use has to increase to try and get that person off you. Um, so just so you know that we do balance things out and we do cover the law aspect. So in a nutshell, what is the law? Uh, basically, you're allowed to defend yourself, defend others, protect your property, and you can make a citizen's arrest. Um, the amount of force that you use depends on the strength of the attacker, the relative strength of the attacker involved, and whether you're willing to use any other means other than violence to stop it. So it could be that you just walk away, it could be you could go out and exit, but if you're blind or visually impaired, you might not see where the exit is. So you could use your voice to try and control things and bring it down, and if all else fails, you can defend yourself but the amount of force you use depends on the person and the size of the person 
and what they're like and how much aggression they're using. And when the person tried to get you in the canal and you threw them instead, had you been doing any martial arts at that stage? How did you how did you make that work? Yeah, I was doing jiu-jitsu at the time. He taught me how to use my stick to defend myself. I held my cane up to defend myself. And he grabbed my cane and I pulled him when he went into the canal. When I held the splash, he just started walking. So, Gosh. I mean, is that something that you would endorse? Do you, do you teach moves with canes or yeah, sticks? Exactly, we do. Um, the cane is an improvised weapon. Uh, if you ask any police officer, and a lot of our instructors are police officers, and our courses are endorsed by the police as well. Um, so everything we teach, we teach within the law. And one of the aspects of the law is uh, an improvised weapon can be anything you have on you that you use in everyday use. David came to us with a, a bunch of techniques about the cane, mm. um, which he actually taught some of us about, um, and we've adapted that into the course. So the, key, the move that he used to throw someone in the canal was one of the moves that David taught. So how did it turn from martial arts to self-defence? The Centre for Personal Safety, all the techniques are taught realistically. Yeah. It's no strange kung fu, crouching tiger, hidden stuff. It's, it's actual practical self-defence. Before David learned self-defence techniques, he hunched over when he walked, his arms were clutched in by his side and his posture was incredibly tense. Now he walks tall and he even uses a longer white cane as a result. I'm a lot happier than I was last year, put it that way. My doctor is pleased with me. But he's noticed a massive difference. I had depression and stuff like that and he's... He's really proud of me. He's happy with me. My family has noticed a massive difference as well. Everybody's noticed a difference in me. I'm walking with my head up. I'm not scared anymore. I'm not thinking, is this going to happen? Is that going to happen? Is somebody going to fly at me with a samurai? So, no, I don't think those things anymore. When I started doing self-defence, I used to walk with my head down. The world was closing in when I was losing my sight. So I kinda, the person I was years ago was cuddled up into a ball. I'm actually doing the action and remembering what it was like when I was walking my back. Posture was horrible, my knees were all straight, I wasn't in a good place, but now I walk, head up, back straight, knees slightly bent, I'm nice and relaxed and I can shout now. Before I was really, really quiet and couldn't say anything. That's probably why they attacked me. Tell me a bit about how you teach your moves as a blind teacher. Uh, very carefully. And this is my fourth class, so very carefully and slowly and with a lot of help. <laughs> So carefully, as in you don't want to like lamp somebody. Accidentally like, poke somebody in the eye or yeah. boot somebody in a place that they don't want to boot it. It's just I'm, I'm very conscious of the fact that I can't see and the people that I'm training can't see. So it's good to have sighted people in to help me. And is it important to have a blind person teach blind and visually impaired people this sort of stuff, or does it make any difference? Oh, I think it makes a huge difference. Um, I think if you've got someone who is blind or visually impaired who is, can stand up and say that I've not only done the course exactly as I'm teaching you just now, but I'm also an instructor. Um, it gives a huge amount of confidence to that person, but it also gives confidence to the people that are taking part because they realise that it's achievable. Uh, my name's Stephen Smith. I live in Pullman, outside Falkirk. Why did you decide to do this class? Because uh, I wanted to find out what it was all about and make myself much safer than that. And have you ever had an experience before uh, that where you could have done with having...? Maybe maybe years ago, just like, just folk, like, falling in the street and that and just things like that and it's, it's made me more safe now, more confident in that and anybody came up to you, you could get, get away. If negotiating with someone or moving away fails, Dave showed me that by holding my cane in both hands across my body at head height, I can not only use it as a barrier, but if someone grabs it, I can push against them and turn to the side, which not only knocks them in the head with the cane, but sends them falling to the ground, hopefully. So basically, I've got the cane straight across me in my two hands like a barrier. Yeah. And I've got my left foot forward, so I'm in yeah. a defensive It's a stand. defensive position, yeah. You use your voice to actually shout, be serious, back away, leave me alone. Back away, leave me alone. Help, if you're actually holding this cane up, they're showing people, because when it was folded in, yeah. nobody could see it. It was right. just you and him. So it's kind of up at my face. So if you're holding it up, people can see there's a cane. There's, you're a blind person being attacked. This is a man with no cane attacking you. So when you feel the contact, the grab, you shout, let go. Let go! Now if you feel the push, I want you to pull and turn to your right. I want you to feel So that. I pull it towards me. And then and turn to your right. right. Yeah, you're actually using your momentum. Okay. So, give me that, give me that. No, what? I want to pull apart. <laughs> the problem with canes is 
in sections. It just came apart there. So they're pushing and I'm pulling. Yeah. And, that, and, and then I twist and I catch them off guard. And they have to let go. And if you actually push them, do you feel... That gives me time to get away. Ah. Uh, so it's actually doing more. So it's twisting your arm. And if you push here, you feel my shoulder here. Yeah. It's actually pushing them. Ah. Uh, that's what we're going with it. So that's really pushing. good. That's it. That's it. Cool. I love it. I feel I feel better about my cane now, to be honest. Emma Tracy, who in future I will treat with even greater deference than before. And that's almost it for today. But we'd especially like to hear from you about any sleep problems that you have and how you've gone about dealing with them. It's well established that people with little or no light perception do experience disturbed sleep patterns. We're planning to report on the latest research, but we want this to reflect real people with real problems and solutions. So please do get in touch. You can call our action line for 24 hours after tonight's programme on 0800 044 044, email in touch at bbc.co.uk or go to our website and click on the Contact Us link. From me, Peter White, producer Lee Kumatat and the team, goodbye.